Welcome everyone to Comics from the Multiverse, episode 422. I am Peter, and joining me as always is Matt. Oh, bing ring. Alright, this is a DC Comics podcast. We get together with all the books we read this week. Coming up on today's show, we have Absolute Power Origins, issue 2, Detective Comics 1087... Did I change that number? I'm questioning that. Uh, we have Zatanna, Bring Down the House, issue 3. We got Power Girl, 12. Batman Off World, issue 5. And Nice House by the Sea, issue 2. Now, I had planned to do one of my Patreon books this week, uh, but we're actually starting recording about an hour late because uh, mm-hmm. my front door suddenly would not lock and I had a, a joiner out messing with the lock for a while. So uh, we are heavily delayed, so Patreon books can wait till next week. Uh, so we'll, we'll get you into say that I, I haven't been able to look what's next week it's going to be a super heavy week I already know uh, that's not uh, whatever that's fine <sighs> that's fine I it's funny because I had a stressful day yesterday as well because I uh, my internet was going in and out so it, it wasn't like a, a huge deal except for the fact that I had a tv show to watch and review I had a review to <laughs> edit and upload and I couldn't do any of it because the internet was going in and out it eventually was fine later in the day but it meant I was up late doing at least some of the stuff that I was supposed to do during the day. So I thought, oh, it's nice. I don't have a heavy week of comics. Uh, you know, I'll get up, I'll read my books. I read one book before the door thing happened. And then that was that was me for a Lovely. couple hours. So, uh, yeah, it's just it's been a hectic couple of days and nothing, uh, nothing going to plan. How's your week been, Matt? How's the finger? Um, it, it still hurts. Uh, I can almost make a fist now. So, uh, but yeah, it, it's, uh, you don't realize how much, even with your non-dominant hand, you use your fingers until one of them hurts really bad when you move it. <laughs> do, do you know what so, I notice? Uh, mm-hmm. No, I've never broken a finger or even dislocated a finger, mm-hmm. but, uh, I, I often get like, uh, you know, that sensitive bit when like skin's peeling off next to your nail and mm-hmm. it's, it's a little bit sensitive for a while. Where I notice that is when I'm in the shower, particularly when I'm doing my, my like, the shampoo and whatnot. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, no, 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 that finger will sting if anything touches it. I have to, like, keep my hand away from the water and do everything with one hand. Uh, I don't know if that's what's going on with the dislocated finger, but I yeah, can sympathize. Uh, it's, it's not that bad, but it's just, like, trying to lift things at work. You don't realize, you know, how much you your grip comes from your fingers oh yeah and not just you know so oh, yeah and the other one is when i've got a bad cat scratch somewhere on mm-hmm. my leg and it stings if water hits it so i have to like mm-hmm. do the shower with like one foot sticking out of the water the yeah. entire time yeah yeah that, that one i just tough out because it's just it's the initial uh and mine's not from cat scratch mine's usually from falling or running uh, into something yeah so no nah, no nah, it's always a cat spit on the legs and they get startled oh, yeah. when they jump away so they dig in just that bit too tight <laughs> and they draw blood the little rascals that they are yep. and i you know for about three seconds i want to strangle the life out of them mm-hmm. uh, then i calm down they subsides that's good but for about three seconds like you know they were they were dancing on a thin kitty grave <laughs> so uh <laughs> Yeah. I mean, otherwise, I guess my week's been all right. Uh, there's nothing particularly yeah. uh, I've, different. I I've been terrible at watching things. I did start the Bear season three, mm. um, so that was pretty enjoyable. Uh, but yeah, I've been very terrible. Wanted to go see Strange Darling this weekend because I've heard I've good heard good word things. Of mouth yeah. Buzz. yeah, I've not seen uh, it, but I've heard good things. And and I have an open Saturday night, and and would you guess it's not playing anywhere close. Uh, and if it is playing close, it's playing at like ten thirty-five at night. Yeah, it's which is far lim- far too late for me. Yeah, it's a more limited release. It's just one of those those yep. things. I mean, I watched various things for shows this week. Although on stream last Sunday night, I was forced to watch a movie called Assassin Thirty Three A.D. Now, do you, you people a, must hate you. Do you have a guess of what this movie is before I explain it? I feel like it's an Assassin's Creed ripoff. Nope. Okay. Okay. No. Well, think think of Assassin thirty three A.D. Uh-huh. Thirty three A.D. Who's about thirty three years old? A.D. Oh my God! It is kind of like <laughs> Assassin's Creed, except he's trying to so it's trying to assassinate Jesus. It is a uh... Christian time travel movie. Matt. Uh, 
you can find it on YouTube, dare you wish to watch it yourself. It's actually shocking, once the time travel stuff starts, how actually complex and primer-esque it kind of gets. However, unlike Primer, this movie does not want you to be confused, so the main character constantly jumps in to narrate things to explain what's going on. So, because there's like multiple trips of time travel happens, like, hey, do you remember the first version of that character? He's still left in that version of the timeline. So that's where we're looking right now. And then he'll say, oh, we're over here now. Uh, also, it was a little uncomfortable because all the villains were Muslim, and given that it was made as a Christian movie, it felt yeah, a bit weird yeah. and like, uh, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, it was laughably bad in places. Honestly, if it was like 20 minutes shorter, I'd probably recommend it as a terrible movie to watch for entertainment's sake. But it's almost two hours, which is, you know, this is a, bit, a bit torturous getting through some of it. Even the director's initials are JC. <laughs> And if you guys uh, feel at all uh, interested, it's on Tubi. Too. It's also you on know, YouTube it... for free. Yeah. So. It's um... the director's cut on YouTube, even. Oh, God. Maybe, maybe there's a sh- shark. Apparently, yeah. the, the genre is called Christploitation, which I, I kind of love as a word. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's weird that we'd what call that, this? though, because the, 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 the whole idea of like something exploitation makes it sound like uh-huh. you're exploiting the thing. I, I wouldn't think yes. Christians would want to refer to their own movies as exploiting of Christ, <sighs> but fair enough. Yes. Who am I to argue? That's... That's saying the quiet part out loud. Uh, yeah. Jeez. Uh, yeah. There was an old Mad TV bit about Terminator uh, and Terminator coming back to stop Jesus from getting crucified. And every time the, the T-800 uh, tried to stop it, Jesus would have to, you know, heal the person. It was actually quite funny. At least, you know, 12-year-old me thought it was hilarious. Mm. So that's that's what this seems like. It's a riff on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that was an experience I lived through. Uh, and lived to tell the tale so so what did you do to deserve that nothing people just can win the right to pick a movie and uh-huh. someone had a sense of humor that's yeah. that's it that's it that, that's so funny that sometimes i'm watching better off dead starring john cusack and sometimes i'm forced to watch assassin 33 ad <laughs> so oh. there it uh, is did did you get a chance to watch the terrifier trailer I actively chose not to. Okay, okay. And then the mum's the word. Yeah. Um, if it pops up in theaters before something yes. else, I, I won't be too yes. mad. But if I'm having the uh, choice to avoid it, I'll uh, I'll yes. stay away. Because I, I I know I'm I know I'm in, I'm in, I'm in right. Yeah, They've got yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't need a trailer. I. It's just the 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 Christmassy of it, you know. <laughs> uh, from when you had me watch Silent Night, Deadly Night, uh, it just <laughs> all of those started rushing back watching the trailer so uh which which ash had said that maybe she didn't want to go to the theater with me and my brother to see it after the trailer i asked her she goes wait what day are you going friday or saturday so you know uh she, she's moved to maybe she wants to see it at the theater i mean it's a bit early for that question it's still you know two months out but yeah also with my brother and his work schedule we do have to plan things you know uh that far enough in advance uh so he, he can you know, line up side projects and whatnot. Okay. But, but yeah, uh, especially if it's just something that I want to see, I have zero issue. I'll make the decision, you know, <laughs> like the last time I went to the movies, we had just finished recording and I was like, Oh, I have just enough time. Uh, yeah. So. I just, I feel like when someone says, are you going Friday or Saturday? That sounds like you're going this week. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, like it's just upon yeah. us. Mm-hmm. But hey, all right, let's get into the business. We have, of course, the, the Kindle rankings, or the uh, list formerly known as the Comicsology Top 10. It's a mixed list. Uh, guesses for number one, Matt? Um, so I'm looking at here, and I have two two options that aren't DC. Um, but I don't know if one of the books is primarily a more physical seller at this point, or a digital so I'm going to go out on the limit, and I'm going to guess that Saga was number one. That is incorrect. That's incorrect. Was it Ultimate X-Men? Nope. Also wrong. Oh, my goodness. It, uh, is it... What else came out that is... Is it X-Men 3? <laughs> nope. Okay, wow. My little cheat code is not working now. No. Nope. Uh, I'll, I'll put you out your misery. It yeah. is, in fact, Aliens vs. Avengers issue one. <laughs> 
Where is that even on League of Comic Geeks? Yeah, that was a new issue one, so it's probably quite far down the list. It's an $8 yeah, issue it one. Is. Jonathan Hickman, uh, I guess, you know... I the, understand. Yeah, between Hickman's name and the fact that Alien's mm -hmm. in the zeitgeist right now, I guess it's... Uh, it's, it's yeah. you know, but still, like $8 for an issue one. Marvel have been doing that yes. a bit too often. That's that's a lot. A hundred a hundred percent Ian Home free maybe. Hmm. Who who can say? Who can say? Uh, issue or number two, I should say, is X Men Three. Uh, this is not a good week for DC, by the way. I'm just going to say that right no. now. Uh, number three is X Force. Number four is Nex or NYX. How you might say it. Uh, mm -hmm. Five is Saga. Six is Amazing Spider Man. Seven is Ultimate X Men. Oh my goodness. Eight is Marvel 85th Anniversary Special. Nine is Absolute Power Task Force 7. <laughs> and number 10 is Green Arrow. So DC got a couple of books right at the end, but hardly the uh, the, the best None of the bunch. None of the ones that we are reading. Yes, we didn't read any of the top 10 books this week, which is just wild. Uh, the one that hurts, I think, more than anything is Detective Comics, which mm -hmm. is number 14 on this list, uh, which, is, which is a shame, because it's very good. Do you good. feel like Word is out that his run is ending, so people might just be waiting. You know, read it all in one go. I don't know. I mean, it's it's never been like a great seller. At least if, it's mm -hmm. going by this ranking chart anyway. It's never been like mm -hmm. high up for for a bat book. I wonder if yeah, people might check out his run when it's done because it is going to be this complete thing that you can read from start uh -huh. to finish. But uh, for whatever reason. Even when Detective is better than Batman, Batman always sells better. It's all, it is it's such a dumb thing, but it's almost like this one's called Batman, so I'll buy mm -hmm. that because it's Batman. I don't know what Detective mm -hmm. Comics is, even though it's like I don't know, like it's the reason it's called DC. Yeah, I, uh, it, it's really dumb, but it really does feel like Batman and Superman just sell more because they're called Batman and Superman, even mm -hmm. if Action or Detective are the better book right now, which is wild. Uh. Otherwise, though, I mean, Zatanna came in at 15, just a, a slot lower. Mm -hmm. uh, nice House of the Lakes, 19, which isn't bad for that book, I don't think. I think because it's a, a non-superhero book that just just happens to be DC published, that's that's perfectly mm -hmm. fine for that. Uh, although Zatanna beat Flash, which, you know, given how we both dropped Flash, uh, I guess more people are doing the same, because it's a bit of a mess. It's telling. So, Very telling. Yeah, there you go. That's, that's the rankings for this week. Uh, I mean, admittedly, I was expecting Marvel to dominate this week because it is kind of a weird. Because mo like most of my DC books this week were, like, you know, mini series, Elseworlds, or you know, like n very few of them were. Oh, this is a main big book, you know, a, a mainline thing. Mm -hmm. Detective was really the only one. Everything else was either. I mean, you've got a tie into an event, I suppose, but the other stuff was all these, you know, black label mini series and things like that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, definitely a strange week. Uh, for for the rankings, but uh, yeah. that's not to say anything about the quality, which we'll get to uh, yeah. momentarily. So, yeah, cool. Uh, but yeah, uh, no real news this week uh, either. So uh, we are starting late, so I don't mind this being a little bit of a shorter episode. So we'll yeah. we'll get firing into the books. Absolute Power Origins issue two. John Liddy writing with Alitha Martinez on the R. So issue one of this was very much like how Amanda Waller started and this issue is the first attempt at the Suicide Squad and how it goes wrong. It's, it's basically the story of how like we need a way to like control them that isn't just like, you know, money or like, because this issue, she kind of tries to inspire some of them even. Like she she, yeah. sits, she sits down and she talks to this, what's uh, Cyc Cyclone? No. Cyclotron. Cyclotron. Uh, yeah. And she's like, "Hey, you you could be special. You could be better." She, you know, the, the book starts with this whole speech about how superheroes are are dangerous and how they they present themselves as as good and wanting to help people. But after the Justice League form to take out this bigger threat, then they're in power and we've lost our rights as a human race and blah 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 blah. And basically sells them this big thing. But by the end, uh, it's this character who's telling the rest of the team that, "Hey." Amanda Waller's feeding us a bunch of lies. Like, we don't have to work for her. We could just not do that. And Waller has to think in her feet. And basically her get out at the end of the issue is to say, hey, Lobo, you only care about the money. I'll pay you double if you kill this guy right now. Which yeah. he does. But this guy's literally got a nuclear bomb inside him. So <laughs> yeah, tragedy strikes so and this entire city is decimated from this explosion. So what I like, though, is it kind of is Amanda Waller in a nutshell, an absolute power in a nutshell. 
in that she is like, oh, these heroes make my life more difficult. They make everyone's life more difficult. It's only a false sense of security. Uh, and so she's, you know, priming up Cyclotron, right? And we find out that Cyclotron was um, somebody that went through a war, right? And then couldn't make ends meet. So he... Oh, no, <laughs> <this well. laughs> that wasn't even an animal uh, right, doing that. That was just a know. ghost. <laughs> yeah, no. So, all right, I'm, we're going to pause this real quick. Um, I bought this Elvira NECA figure I've been looking for, right? Uh-huh. Ever since, ever since I got her, something keeps knocking it down. Now, maybe she's top-heavy. It is Elvira, right? But every single day, she falls. Every day, I put her back up, no matter where, where I put her, how sturdy it is. So you say ghost, jokingly, but I'm about to go get some sage, and we're going to kick this MF out of here because I'm getting <laughs> real tired of this. So she fell during recording last week, right? Uh, I don't know if anybody noticed. And now we just had this massive tumble. So it's really starting to piss me off, if you can't tell. So, <laughs> and, and my poor cat now just took off because she got, you know, she was laying comfortably over here. Um, anyways, uh, starting back about Cyclotron, right? Uh, um, he was in a, in a war. He's a veteran, right? <laughs> Oh, just kids. a second. Do you want me to yes. edit that out? Because I don't really feel like I need to, but you said pause no. this, so I'm not sure what I'm doing. I just was pa that was for effect. Okay, know? sure, like, yeah. I'll go. Keep you know, going. You don't need to. So <laughs> uh Cyclotron War, right? Veteran can't make ends meet, so he volunteers for this experiment where they put like kind of this energy in him, but he he really can't control the expenditure. So he's kind of just like this walking, ticking time bomb. Um and so I don't know how exactly how useful he was for the squad, right? But he's there, and Waller's almost using him as the wedge for the team, right? Because she's talking him up about how this is the real important work, right? You guys, you know, are going into this country, and, you know, if you have to give your life, you have to. But you already know that you're a soldier. So for him ultimately to not betray her, but to be like, hey, I know she's full of it. We need to take care of ourselves, Right, she's just using all of us. I kind of like where that went. I like, I like that it's kind of like a the the like the first attempt using the carrot just doesn't doesn't work, right? And she mm -hmm. has to think in her feet, and it leads to this tragedy because obviously when Lobo kills this guy, he sets yep. off a nuke. Now obviously Lobo survives, and like I think you know uh, Johnny Sorrow was on the team. He probably <sighs> survived that because yeah. So I'm looking at the people that were on that team, and you had Johnny Sorrow, you had Emerald Empress, Doctor Polaris, Cyclotron Lobo. Um, is that how the green I, shirt? I, th I was thinking yeah. that was a uh, what's her Fire? face? No, uh, who, who's the villain in the first Suicide Squad movie? Oh God, oh, what was her name? Um, was it Enchantress? Was it? Yes, Enchantress. Is it okay? Right. Yes. Right. So yeah, no, that was uh, Emerald Empress. Um, she's she's a Legion villain, so maybe uh, tiny wimey stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't she know. usually has that big green eye, right? The Emerald Eye of Ekron. Ah, um, I see, I see. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but so, so most of this team probably didn't die from this because they're all right. superhuman enough that they don't, mm -hmm. you know, the nuke won't phase them. But it's this idea that Amanda Waller's just like, ah, oh, can I need to find a way to spin this to the president? Who but mm -hmm. we see that scene where the president, like, we set up a nuclear device on a foreign, you know, country on a, on a nation. Like, it doesn't matter mm -hmm. what they were doing. Like, this is a problem, uh, and she's willing to cover it up. Of course, she's willing to do whatever it takes. Blah blah blah. So I, I like that part of it. Like, I really like that moment where she's realizing that she's being outsmarted by mm -hmm. these, this team, right? By this one character in particular, and mm -hmm. just how she quickly solves it by murdering him. It's like, okay, we need to start with that. We have to have the threat of murder be up front. That has to be the thing that drives their entire mm -hmm. motivation. Uh, and then by the end, it's like, yeah, we've developed this thing that will blow up their heads, regardless of their mm -hmm. superpowers. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I like all that. Yeah. And then, like, at the end, it's the, the Suicide Squad that we, you know, kind of know, right? It's your dead shot. It's yeah. Bronze Tiger. It's Boomerang. Enchantress, she's there in the corner. So I like that this was kind of the proto team. Yeah. Right? That led to her having that idea. It, and she still calls a Task Force X here, right? It's yeah. not. Because I was thinking, uh, like, how, because, how, how, you know, before I realized, oh, this initial team don't have the bombs in their necks, I was yep. thinking... Where's the bomb in sorrow? Because I feel like mm -hmm. <laughs> there's no there's no neck to uh no. to, to to put it in, but you know. Also, I like to think that he was just there to cause chaos. 
Oh, like he's just, Naturally. you know, he's just there to be like, yeah, well, I got nothing else to do. I'm, I'm an interdimensional demon, you know? Yeah. Uh, there's a scene early on where Waller goes to like a like a tax office and there's like no context. You don't understand what she's done here until yeah. later. Because she like shows something on her phone to this guy and says, you know, you'll stay away. Uh, I'll never see you again, blah, blah. And he's like clearly distraught and he's like, okay, she's clearly threatened them with blackmail material, but we don't know mm -hmm. why or, you know, what it's for. <laughs> and it turns out it's actually her daughter's fiance mm -hmm. that she's scaring away from marrying her. And her daughter pulls her up and says, hey, he told me what you did. And Amanda's like, oh, you, do, you don't know all these secrets. Like, I do. I know him. Like, I know everything. He tells me everything. Yeah. Uh, and, like, we never find out exactly what it was on the phone. There's yeah. maybe... A, she, Amanda talks about control and this, like, giving uh -huh. into his inhibitions, which makes me think he's into some kinky stuff, maybe? Like, that's... You know? or, or a gambling problem, right? Something maybe. along those lines. But would gambling, know? like, show up in a photograph? I mean, if he's... Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's his debts. Or something. Oh, I don't maybe, know. yeah. Right? Uh, I, I was thinking, oh, he's in like dominatrix gear with the yeah. like, uh, you know, some was like a gimp there spanking him or something. I don't, I don't know what <laughs> weird shit he's getting into. Uh, but hey, so I, may, I maybe, maybe was... what Amanda Waller's not realizing though is that her uh -huh. own daughter is into this stuff. Yeah. Maybe, maybe yeah. she's not realizing my daughter's a freak and I should let yeah. them be freaks to their happy content. Well, that that's kind of the you know anti antithesis of her. Right, just let let the superheroes be superheroes, but she can't, right? So she wouldn't l allow just her daughter to be herself either. <laughs> yeah, her daughter comes out to her one day. Uh -huh. Mom, I do wear a mask, but it's not for superheroics. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, uh, I don't save anyone. I punish people yeah. if you get my drift. <laughs> well, she has the Punisher. No, it doesn't work for me, and locks her up. Right. Uh, so no at, at first when we see that she's at the tax office i thought she was just a government official uh you know making her taxes disappear right <laughs> yes we thought like, she's so like, i don't want to pay taxes anymore yeah, i've got black work material. For me. I'm, I'm living i'm living off grid now you know amanda <laughs> waller doesn't exist oh uh, uh, yeah jeez yeah. um yeah ours pretty solid uh throughout you know i it, it's not mm -hmm exceptional by any means but it's a really solid house style kind of look to it uh i think waller's various expressions the, the disappointment on her face after she had to kill cyclotron uh mm -hmm. and the the nuke that goes off and it's just kind of like you know she's just annoyed by it she's she's not like feeling the the weight of the she's just killed i mean she fly out says in a narration at one point or even maybe it's to the president oh i mean i, I don't have time to save the population of some other country like all yeah. i care about is the american country and like the, the mm -hmm. democracy of our country um, you know, they obviously the entire thing is kind of like wrapped up in hypocrisy, though, because I'm like, I don't know if this feels. You say you're saving democracy. I don't know if you did all this from the shadows and thinking, you know, you know what knows best is yeah. that democratic. Quite frankly, Amanda. Yeah. But and that's always been Waller's thing, right? Because even in Checkmate, she would find herself at odds with the other side, right? Because Checkmate, you you had the the white team and then. The, the you know the so you had like the white knights and the black knights and all that other stuff and a walla walla was always on that covert team opposite of of like alan scott or whatever and it was the same argument here everything that i do in the shadows justifies democracy and you know alan scott would be like i don't know if it does we kind of fought against that in world war ii you know mm -hmm. uh and so I, I do like that it seems like ridley here really is getting at what makes waller tick and he's just driving it home with you know even further here now that she's doing government work. Yeah, it's the same with her kids. Like, you know, she she promises her daughter she won't become this monster that her daughter thinks she's becoming. And then she immediately says to the president almost in the very next scene, I mm -hmm. lie to my kids. I promised them I wouldn't be a monster, but I'll be whatever mm -hmm. it takes. Like, the way she treats, mm -hmm. like, her daughter's fiancé is exactly how she treats superheroes. She's like, mm -hmm. this is a problem I have to solve, even though no one else is saying it's a problem. So right. it's, yeah, it, like... I don't like this issue as much as the first issue because I think mm -hmm. the first issue was more of a a really strong character building issue. Yeah. Whereas this is a little bit more oh the first attempt at the Suicide Squad. So this is a bit more I guess mm -hmm. normal by comparison, but it's it's still doing some interesting things with the character. It definitely feels yeah. like Amanda Waller Morgan into her prime is what we think of her as. Yeah, and I it's also though I like that you look at her and she's a woman that's had to take stuff into her own hands, right? Like, she cannot trust anybody to do stuff for her. Uh, and, and even here, like, yes, yeah, she she put the the Suicide Squad there in that country, right? But when things got out of control, she took it back. 
uh, by having Lobo kill the guy. So, you know, she's she's a person that I don't say does, isn't afraid to get her hands dirty, but she's not afraid to get dirty hands to solve that problem. Uh, and I like how here it it showed that by her going into that country that felt vaguely familiar, felt like a very vaguely northern Korean country. Um, so well, what was it? I think Lobo called it some vaguely communist yeah. or something. Yes. I don't know. It's something like that. <laughs> but they they had called the leader the Great Sun. And I know that that is a term mm. that is used over there. Um, so yeah, it shows well, that she's that was the, in, the the team of the villains, right? That was the was that is that what it was? Yeah, yeah. The villain team was called the Great Sun, I think. Oh, uh, Okay. Which don't get me wrong, it's probably a reference to yeah. that. But like, like, well, no, it says yeah. I, I send them to well, that was a North Kami stand or whatever, home of the dictator. His people called the Great Sun. So that's, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. But that could also have been the team as well, right? You know. No, no, I think um, you're right. I think you're right. I think I just I, I was remembering it back incorrect. I think you're, yeah. I think you're getting them with the great ten. Just having great. I think that's what I'm there. thinking of. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but but no, I like that and the fact that she's like, yeah, no, I'm a monster, and I, I'm fine with it. I, she has I, I, zero qualms with any of this. I also like the idea that like that little moment of desperation when like because you know the comms go off and she can't hear yeah. what they're saying and she's like panicking like I need to hear what they're saying mm -hmm. right now. Like I think that few seconds of uncertainty is why she's like oh. They're going to have bombs in their necks forever now yep. because she cannot live with the yeah. idea of not being in control for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it does kind of paint this idea that I'll be I'll be very satisfied to see how she gets taken down by the end of absolute power. If she even does, mm -hmm. maybe it'll be more, maybe less of a she just straight up loses and more of a kind of a sideways mm -hmm. kind of like the heroes stop what's happening, but maybe Waller has something else out of it by the end. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. We'll see. But, mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, for, yeah, it's all a tie-in issue, to be honest. Uh, you know, obviously it's not tied into the current events so much as it's more just like kind of giving some more depth to like the the antagonist mm. in the story. But yeah, yeah valid all the so, time. So, so this led me down a like a, a bit of a because I don't know much about the Suicide Squad. I've never really read those old issues by Ostrander, so I started looking into the history just to see if this was referencing anything like that. Because I know Ridley uh, has done that in the past, where he's used you know storyline stuff to add to like in-world continuity yeah. or in-world timelines. Uh, and, and that led me to find out that the first time Barbara Gordon was ever Oracle was for Amanda Waller in the Suicide Squad. I think uh, I knew that. Cause I, th I think yeah. I knew Oracle's, you know, it depends how you phrase this, I suppose, but yeah. I knew that Oracle's quote unquote first appearance was in Suicide Squad. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so, but of course it was in, in grand Amanda Waller fashion under duress Right. She was forcing her to essentially be a comms operator. Uh, and then later, I think it was Dixon that did Birds of Prey. Yeah, yeah. He's the one that kind of turned her turned information broker and all, and all that other stuff. But yeah, I did not realize that. Did not, And that came so soon. I think it was in 1990 was the first time. So, you know, from Killing Joke to her and Suicide Squad, Barbara Gordon really wasn't doing anything. Um, so Ostrander kind of put her back into that spot, which well, that was very interesting. Well, it, it, it makes sense with like what she what she does, right? Is that Waller mm -hmm. takes someone who like like the cyclotron guy who's kind of like lost his way. This idea that Babs, after she couldn't be Batgirl anymore, yeah. was in this sort of vulnerable position. But of course, comic books then took that or and turned it mm -hmm. into oh, she's going to do that. She's going to choose to do that herself for everyone else. Yeah, she's going to be right. that for the heroes and not just be this this lapdog for Amanda Waller. So. It turned mm -hmm. into a, a, a good thing. I know there wasn't a good thing in that book, but I, I just mean for the character. Like, I'm sure Babs didn't like being forced to do it. No. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. And from, from the stuff that I was reading, it was definitely one of those struggles where she doesn't want to be doing this and Waller's threatening her with X, Y, and Z, you know, uh, even coming after her personally, saying stuff like, well, what are you going to do? It's not like you can get up and walk away, you know? So just prime villain oh, stuff. That's, yeah, that's super dark. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, it's funny how like something like that leads to Barbara being Oracle, and that's something mm -hmm. that stuck for basically yeah. forever. Really, I know she became yeah. Batgirl again, but she's still back mm -hmm. to being Oracle all the time. So yeah, I it mean, it wasn't until New Fifty Two in two thousand and eleven, right? That she became Batgirl again. So. Yeah, but even since then, she still kind of just dips back mm -hmm. out of the computer chair all the time. So uh -huh. it's just became a permanent part of her character. It's just interesting. Yeah. Uh, all right, what are you rating uh, um, Origins issue two? I'll give this a seven. Uh, yeah, I, I'd, I'd even go seven point five. I, I think it's just mm -hmm. not quite into that great territory, but I think it's a solid tie-in if you if you're mm -hmm. enjoying fleshing out Amanda Waller a bit along with the event. So cool. 
Detective Comics 1087 Ram V rating with, unfortunately, Gillen March on art. Uh, Joe's funny, I didn't notice he was doing this issue, and I, no. I was reading the issue, and I'm like, a couple pages in, I'm like, why is the art not as good as it usually is? What's going on? Uh, sure enough, so that was why. When, when we got to the first page, I was like, for Gillen March, this is not bad, right? Like, and then the further it went, and the more the proportions got a little bit wonky, I yeah, was kind of like, no, honestly, okay. I, I think that's the thing, is the first page actually mm -hmm. doesn't look like Gillen March that much. No. It just looks like a... I don't know who I'd say it looks like, but I, I, it didn't yeah. scream Gilla March at me right mm -hmm. away. It wasn't until, uh, I don't know, a few pages later maybe. I, I think the big thing is that, honestly, most of it's fine yeah. un until Batman shows up and Batman yes. looks horrendous. <laughs> right? Oh. And the, the, all the uh, plasters on like Batman's like chin and stuff, like in the yeah. way, like, it's, it's just, he's got that Gil and March look to how he's drawn, and that's where it mm -hmm. all started. And I was like, wait, what's, what's going on with the art all of a sudden? And I was like, oh, it's Gil and March. Which yeah. you're right, it does make the first chunk of the book kind of impressive for him, mm -hmm. but yeah. yeah. So so for me, it was uh, that you turned to page two, and just the proportions on Nightwing are very, <laughs> are very March esque. Sure, um, sure. It's such know. a small part of the the uh -huh. page, though, that it didn't stick out to me yeah. that much, I guess. It, it, uh, seemingly, like, drawing Joker's daughter wasn't too bad. And even drawing oh. the eyed lady with the ten-eyed man kind of yeah. worked uh, All well those enough. pages I thought were really good, but you're right. You get to Batman, and suddenly Batman looks off, and then you turn the page and freeze, and, and the other, the, you know, the... the We'll just call him the other guy because I forget his name right now. The blood one. Um, yeah, the blood guy. He looks all that stuff looks pretty good, you know. So I yeah. would say pretty pretty adept at kind of drawing Joker's daughter and these monsters. Um, but when you get to Batman, I don't know. He's he's just off. Yeah. Uh, that said, though, the actual story content of the issue mm -hmm. is very good. We're really ramping up to the conclusion here. Uh, Joker's daughter turns out that was just like an empty puppet. Uh, mm -hmm. that was like making the, the call it wasn't uh, ours and we find out where he is later he is indeed still mm -hmm. with Talia as we find out uh, later in the issue but uh, she's like yeah uh, I've made this more interesting like all, all the poor people in Gotham like, hey I've planted bombs in all those districts uh, mm -hmm. so maybe the only way you could survive is if you go and hang out with all the rich people and of course my favourite part of all this though is when it cuts to uh, mummy Mummy Arzen. Uh-huh. <laughs> All right. Orgum. Uh, Orgum, thank you. Uh, yes. And she's, like, just furious and like, what is wrong with this city? What is the matter with the people here? They're all mad. And, and it's just because it feeds into that whole idea of thinking they can just come in and control Gotham, but it's all of the crazy characters that are going to, like, fight back in various ways, and it's yeah. starting to piss her off. I really... That, I found that quite enjoyable, her reaction well, yeah. to that. And you're kind of rooting for the weirdos. Right? Like, yeah, yeah. Essentially, the organs have come in and gentrified and almost like colonized things, right? They're this old world European family, and they've tried to come over and take over this land only for the people that live there to be like, nah, we, we don't, we deal with worse things than you. We, we'll fight back, you know? And when you take away the sheen of, of their control and all of their stuff that they've done, you know, by gentrifying uh, with Joker's daughter. Her going, hey, all you, you know, lesser than the, the people that don't have stuff, right? Go to them. They're your real enemy, right? It's not us weirdos. Uh, and again, I having read some of other uh, Ramby's other creator owned stuff, that is a theme that he is constantly going back to. Uh, and so I appreciate that. Yeah, and it's not even the city or the, the people in the city are fighting back. It is the weirdos who are fighting back. It's those mm -hmm. extreme elements, it's those things that are usually a negative that just. Like these arguments can't mm -hmm. like fight through, and yeah. this this actually probably did the best job actually of like separating all the various like soldiers she has because yes you know because it does it multiple times where she's like hey where the hell is in this case it's Shavad's the first one the eye lady yep. and uh you know cut to ten eyed man being like those aren't real eyes they're just painted on your mask I've actually got ten eyes and <laughs> starts messing with her with his powers and like you know obviously it's not a literal thing that happens but the, the visual yeah. art of like him just prodding her eye and her entire body just he... like shattering into pieces yeah and I love that page it's probably some of the most that I've ever liked Gilla March because it does it her shattering in that way and just you know the mess of it it is and with the way that Ted-Eyed Man is drawn, almost Spider-Man-esque, 
right? There's a, a lot of motion in, in his form. I, I thought that was really well done. Yeah, yeah, he's got all the threads that are mm -hmm. kind of like Spider-Man's webs almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because this is the thing of this issue, is that each of her main soldiers has a different villain from Gotham stopping them. And it's mm -hmm. like, Batman's coming for her, but all the mm -hmm. others are dealing with Gotham villains. And arguably the Joker, by proxy of his daughter, has, is, is the one dealing with the population. And then you've got these other key rogues dealing with uh, the, the foot soldiers. So... Ten Iron Man's got Shavad. When we get to the Blood Guy, that's Mister Freeze, and he's mm -hmm. prepped for that. And when we get to the Werewolf, that's Two Face. And you know, these are all big I, scenes that happen. I like how they all balance each other, right? Shavad with all the eyes, she's coming up against Ten Iron Man, Freeze, and then the Blood Guy, right? You know, you could say that there's something to do with, you know, uh, and not necessarily the blood of of Mister Freeze, but you know, there's something in him. That that is different too, and then oh, well, the, 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 I think what you're getting at is that the blood guy literally controls his te blood temperature up and temperature. down. So there's there we a, go. There's yeah, a yeah, temperature yeah. thing, uh, right. and then and then with Two Face, you've got the idea that you know the, werewolf is literally two duality. Yeah, two people. Yeah. It's two personalities, if you will. Yes. So and so I like how they split all those up, and those it makes for some really horrific, in, in like in a good way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Events that occur. Yeah, so Batman's like storming the the I think it's the prison where uh uh the art like the mummy Orgum is. Yep. And you know, we go back to Mr. Freeze and this, you know, the at first he's in the ice, uh the, mm -hmm. the villain. Um yeah. Uh, I'm looking for his name because I saw it and I was like, Oh, it's that's, that's what it is. It's Niang. Niang, that's right. Yeah, it's just, it's the page right before uh, it cuts yep. to him. Uh but he breaks out the ice and is like, Hey, I can control my body temperature and my blood. And then it turns out Mr. Freeze accounted for this because he didn't know which of the villains was coming for mm -hmm. him. So he prepped for all of them. And his prep for him is that there's something in, in the in the ice that when uh -huh. he, hit, he, he heated it up with his body, it, it he ingested it. And it's actually now coagulating his blood. So now he can't use his like fancy blood powers anymore. Uh -huh. And he's lying there in a pool of his own blood, just kind of like freaking out. Technically not dying. But because no. this is the same with you know the next scenes, uh, Two Face and the Werewolf, mm -hmm. and I do love this that like the Werewolf's got him pinned, and mm -hmm. Two Face is like, well, I'll just have to you know sacrifice one of myself, and he shoots mm -hmm. through himself with the silver bullets to take down the wolf, but he only does it on the Harvey Dent side, which is really uh -huh. funny. But he does have a good reason. He's like, hey, technically the heart's on my side, so yeah. this was more likely to keep us alive. <laughs> I do love that because the shock, right? Because um, Ten Claw, the werewolf, is is like kind of he's already celebrating that he's won, yep. right? He goes, I, you know, I've eaten some silver, but it'll take more than a gun-toting gangster to take me out. And he goes, huh? Nah, nah I don't know why I use him as bait. And he goes, who? And then he shoots through himself. Yeah. All right. So Two Face isn't even, you know, saying that he used himself as bait. He used Harvey yes. as his bait. Um, and just it's a great you know, him shooting through himself. Yeah. yeah. It might be an all-time Two-Face moment here. Yeah, uh, he tosses the coin if he should finish the job, and mm -hmm. it lands on Tails, uh, or equivalent, and he's like, okay, mm -hmm. I could keep tossing the coin until I can kill him and, and shoot him in the head, but Batman wouldn't like that, so I'll do mm -hmm. a good deed and just call it there and go off. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah, all these scenes with the villains were all great. It, it really felt like a big culmination having all the various villain entities and it's fun having Ten-Eyed Man in there because he feels like a new addition to that sort of rose gallery yeah. whereas yeah. Freeze and actually thinking about it Two-Face is really really old Freeze is old now but he's nowhere as old yeah. as Two-Face and then mm -hmm. Ten-Eyed Man's a pretty new addition to the rose galleries at least it feels that way anyway yeah. so, well, it feels, so it feels like a nice spread over the you know three of them yeah and this version of Freeze especially because this is more I feel like this is you know Heart of Ice style Freeze right yeah, where you kind of got that gravitas I mean, ever, uh, ever since that animated series, like that's mm -hmm. kind of, for the most part, the Mr. Freeze we've had in the comics is, yeah. is kind of based on that. So yeah, it feels like almost different eras of Gotham coming together as well, you know? Yeah. So Batman's fighting uh, Mummy Argum. Mm -hmm. uh, she's very pissed about all this, and she's like... By the way, her name is Dariah. So, that doesn't even sound familiar. No, but but it is. Uh, Dariah, I just, sure. I, okay. I pulled her up on League of Comic Geeks. So... Yeah, like, Batman's fighting her, and she's like, look, this is not exactly all went to plan, but, you know, like, this chaos will still give us results we want, because we're switching to fear now anyway. I've got Jonathan Crane hooked up to the reality engine in there, pumping fear throughout the city, 
So even if it's not how we originally planned to do this, but we're adjusting for all the, all the crap that you're throwing at us, mm-hmm. the city is just going to have to be controlled by the- fear. And the end of the issue is, you know, she's broadcasting stuff out to the wor- uh, to the city to and cause panic, and she herself transforms into a big double mouthed monster <laughs> of some kind. Yeah, do a something. I I don't even know what you call this. It's it's very. Uh, Hmm. It's very, it's very HR Giger, I'll say. Yeah, down, yeah, down to the double face, you know, that resembles something else, maybe with teeth. You know, <laughs> well, it's double face. It was more just the skeleton, though, made me think of Giger. Yeah. It was making me think yeah. uh, more, less alien and more species. If you've seen that, mm-hmm. and how mm-hmm. how Cell looks in that, uh, in her okay. natural form, I was getting a little bit of that, but. Def- definitely a creepy, monstrous uh, visual, but it definitely feels like we're building up to the, the big climax here. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, she's that, that, she's icky, man. The, the What she was revealed as, even worse than any of these other creatures that, that we've had. You know, I thought the blood guy was kind of gross just because the stuff that he was doing with the blood, you know, it was almost uh, Cronenbergian yep. there. Uh, but here, this one, just, just like, yeah, mm. Uh, really good stuff, though. I, I, I mean, like, actually, when you I, think of it that way, like, there's the three henchmen plus her, you've got yeah. very different types of horrific images. You've yeah. got the sort of surreal with the with Shavad, right? You've got mm-hmm. that sort of, like, David Lynch almost, like, this yeah. is all not making sense. It's very abstract. And then you've got a werewolf, which is a very classic horror movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got the blood guy, who's a lot more... Like body horror, like you say, Cronenberg guess, mm-hmm. and you've got this, which is a, a lot more kind of cerebral, like, like monster design. That's, they're all very yeah. different, like types of of, of mm-hmm. horror entity. That's quite yeah. of an interesting choice, actually. Now that I'm thinking about it, yeah, uh, it makes for a, a nice mixed uh, issue yeah. of of, of so, chaos. So, a good friend of mine's getting back into comics now because he had questions about Absolute Batman. And he thinks the design's real stupid. And then as we were talking about it, he goes, oh, wait, you do a weekly show. What, what's been good over at DC? So I, I've been giving him a list of stuff. And, you know, he's just, he charged through Green Lantern because Green Lantern was one of his characters. Uh, and he's asked what else. And so I, I recommended a bunch of Ram V. And he just kept seeing that name. He goes, who is this guy? And I was like, well, you have to read and find out. Um, and so I, I sold him uh, Detective Comics is the next thing he's going through. So I'm I'm very curious to see where he goes uh, with, with all of this, because hmm. um, uh, I all I sold him was kind of the the broad strokes of the organs coming to Gotham and trying to take over and what that means for Batman. Um, and so yeah, he's in. And then if he likes that, he has Swamp Thing lined up, which I'm very excited for because any chance I get to talk about that Swamp Thing book, I do. So, um, but yeah, Ram V here again, stuff of nightmares, just like with Swamp Thing. Speaking of. You know, like when when we got into those creatures uh, and those designs, uh, he's he's really good at this. It's an understatement, honestly. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, uh, no, I mean, story wise, this was a great issue. It felt like much like last time where I said it felt like everything was coming together and paying mm-hmm. off. This still felt like that. This felt like a lot mm-hmm. of payoff. The everything that we've been doing for about a year and a half or whatever it's been since uh, all this kicked off. But the art is a little bit of a, a detriment. Not the entire issue, surprisingly. Yeah. Like some pages are actually pretty decent for for at least yeah. by Gil and Marchy standards. But it is definitely a step down, and that's a bit of a shame that it's just kind of slotted in here right towards the end. We've got this filling mm-hmm. artist that's not anywhere nearly as good. But yeah. uh, with that aside, though, certainly still a lot to like in the issue. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. what are you rating Detective Comics? Um, primarily for the story, uh, I'm gonna give this eight point five. Uh, yeah, oh, there's a backup, actually. Yeah, <laughs> Before I was we... going to say, are we going to get the backup, too? Cause... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I read the backup. Okay. The backup, actually, yeah. is quite important, because it's uh, mm-hmm. presumably going to come into play in the, the last part of the story. Uh, so, basically, yeah, it's, uh, Talia uh, has mm-hmm. got uh, Arzen, and she has him in, like, a, a big test tube, and it's basically mm-hmm. saying, hey, the Lazarus pits are gone, but for years, the League of Assassins have been has been trying to do it artificially, like, trying to synthesize... Mm-hmm. Lazarus juice and can mm-hmm. they pull it off and seemingly for the first time ever they have like you know she spends a lot of time talking or narrating and then eventually Arzen wakes up and is like wait my mom killed me what's going on and effectively you know we're leaving us in this position 
where he's going back to the city to confront his mother uh, mm -hmm. along with Talia. And Talia, in some way, uh, you know, kind of implies at the end here that she's almost a little envious because this character, because she, she relates to him because she, he'd been raised to be a specific thing for, you know, his mother's empire, which is exactly what Raz is like with her. You know, she's yep. got this purpose and the, and, the, and the demon and all that. But he here is kind of become free of it because he now knows mm -hmm. that, that his mother had turned on him uh, and that he was just a cog in the wheel and he wasn't actually important to her in the traditional sense. Uh, and he's kind of free of that now. And in some way, she kind of is envious of that. That's an yeah. interesting little point to make here, yeah. I thought. But it is a, an important backup, if only because, yeah, he's going to probably show up in the last part of the story. And we'll probably, if you hadn't read the backup, you might be like, wait. Where'd he come from? Yeah, he's up. He's, yeah. he's alive. He's walking around. What's going on? Yeah. What I what I liked here too was uh, Talia talking about Roz and her questioning and what what it was like to go through the Lazarus uh, experience. Mm. And and he he thinks that she's talking about like the weakness, but she's just wondering like because it it messes with your mind, right? Like how is she sure this is her dad that comes back every time? Uh, and I always I like that aspect of it. Well, it's from someone that. You know, she's watched him do this how many times, you know, and, and, you know, it's almost like the, you know, yeah, he eventually comes back to what, what she knows. Um, but, you know, so as she's watching Arzen, you know, get, you know, almost like Luke in the back to tank, right? You know, she's having these thoughts as well. Like, is he going to come back as whole? You know, have we perfected it even more than what it was? And I thought that was another interesting aspect well, to bring on the I don't even so much think it was like that she was concerned that her dad wouldn't come back properly. She does bring up, of course, that someone mm -hmm. can come back wrong because their brain's too damaged after right. dying. But it was more that she was. She said she was curious about just if it hurt or not. Um, mm -hmm. And I think to me, the point of that little conversation or her little memory there is that Raz would just be annoyed that she'd even ask that. That she would even want an explanation of the purpose of it, like. Oh, mm -hmm. you know, like I do this so that the Raz Al Ghul Empire or, or purpose or order will continue forever. And she's like, I would, you know, she's thinking to herself, I was just curious if it hurt. Uh, that's all. But how that's changed over the years. I don't, I, to, to me, I kind of read that as like her remembering how much he doesn't even include her in yeah. like the, the, the thought process or, or, or anything. You know, she heaps her at this right. distance, right? It kind of furthers that divide between mm -hmm. them. And like her realizing that she is just kind of a, a, a not a cog, but like a yeah, a, you know, she's got a purpose for him, but it's not this loving like equality like father right. daughter he'll, relationship kind of thing. He'll never look at her as the as the heir, right? Yes. That's the whole point of Damien. That was the whole point of setting her up with Bruce was to you know for if Bruce didn't want to be the heir for her to produce an heir, and so yeah, so the fact that now that Arzen gets to be away from that. And it's almost a point of jealousy for her. I I really like that adding layers to Talia. Yeah, because on some level she's never completely just mm -hmm. sort of like not disowned her father. That's not the right word, yeah. but completely severed the tie where she doesn't care anymore, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Right. She she always still has in some form mm -hmm. or another. So no, it's it's, it's an interesting little character thing yeah. there for Talia. I, I think that's what makes the backup work kind of well. Mm -hmm. Is that it's got some explore, exploration of Talia as a character to kind of give it some depth beyond just what the plot's doing, but the plot is what the important thing is for the story, is that, oh, Arzen's back up. <laughs> he's, he's alive, mm -hmm. and he knows what his mother did, and perhaps uh, is going to have some things to say about it. He's probably going to be like, Mother, what, you, you killed me, Mother. I didn't appreciate that. Uh, yeah. I'm going to stab you, Mother. <laughs> or something to that effect. Yeah. What if, is that voice? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, okay. I don't know if you're doing something from a movie or no. Or what. I think, I think, I think it's what I imagine. Uh, if the doll Brahms could speak, uh, that's what I imagine he would sound like. Uh, you recorded with Tim too much recently. I, I, yeah, that's probably true. We recorded extra yeah. episodes for October, so yeah. Uh, Tim's wormed his way into my brain. <laughs> that's, that's the ultimate horror because mm. there can only be one Tim. He's like a Highlander, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh dear uh, no nah, but the backup was a, a decent little addition and does feel like it's important to the overall story uh, Dan Waters once again right and Christopher Mitten yeah. was on the art for that I'm very curious to see how his Nightwing's gonna go because he's proven proven uh, this is Waters anyways 
uh, proven to have a kind of a good handle yeah, on Gotham. It's interesting that he's, he's testing the waters a little bit in the back up of Detective, and it's uh-huh. Taylor's coming to Detective to take over that, yeah. and he's going to Nightwing to take over that. It's yeah. A little bit funny. Uh, mm-hmm. But, uh, all right, so you gave what, the book 8.5, did 8, you say? 8.5, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah I... Th- I am going to give it an eight, and that is that is it would be a nine with with mm-hmm. better art, with good art, but with with Gellar March stinking up the place yeah. a bit, it's it's an eight is the ceiling, I think ultimately. Mm-hmm. But that, that that's a testament to how much I'm enjoying the overall story he, that's happening. He must be like one of the like funniest and well-meaning guys because there's so many top writers that, <laughs> that work with him and have nothing but good things to say oh yeah he, he, he must be a gem of a human being but i just yeah. do not like his art <laughs> yeah it's just one of those things which, like i'm not a fan there, there are like wrestlers like that like i'm sure you're great i just don't want to watch you wrestle hey there's, there's, there's di- directors like that like like yeah. Guillermo del toro seems like a lovely human being yes. i just don't like his movies yeah that, that, that's good <laughs> so there you go uh all right, what will we get on to next here? Let's have a look. Mm-hmm. Uh, Zatanna, Bring Down the House, issue three, Mariko Tamaki on the writing with Javier Rodriguez on the art. So, uh, yeah, we had the this bunny girl show up mm-hmm. <laughs> in the last issue, and this issue is very much presenting her as an opposite force to the Council of Magicians that are kind of investigating Zatanna right now. Uh, and, you know, Stranger Girl kind of pops back into it as well after arguing mm-hmm. with her bosses for a little bit. But, yeah, Zatara's like, hey, are you a bunny? Are you one of my bunnies? And Bunny Girl's like, no, I'm not a bunny. Mm-hmm. As she, you know, sips some carrot soup. The carrot soup, yeah. yeah. Uh, but basically, yeah, you use magic, right? You, you've you been abusing it, even. And Zatara's just like, oh my god. I love the speech bubble here, because it's just like oozing, like... Uh-huh. It's not even like icicles like sometimes you get when characters are yeah. angry. This is more just like a breaking down angry where I'm like, oh my, why do people keep bringing this shit up? I don't it's, do magic. Ma- magic? It, magic. <laughs> yeah, it, it's oozing like irritation. Yes. 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 Very, very good. Uh, and then Bunny Girl like headbutts her with a little, just a little tap. And it sends Think. her into this two page spread of just crazy art of Zatanna going... Well, as she puts it, is this a is this down the rabbit hole? And Bunny Girl's like, no, 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 it's a bunny well, mm-hmm. <laughs> legally distinct. Feels feels a bit of a semantic distinction. That's what how the Tana responds. Yeah. Um, this page in particular, there's a lot going on, um, but it, like in the best way possible. Yeah, lots of uh, colors, lots of uh-huh. you know, it really does feel kind of crazy and a little bit psychedelic. Uh, and what this leads to is Zatanna, like, being trapped with a monster, a giant bunny monster with one eye and huge mm-hmm. teeth. I love mm-hmm. that it's all sharp teeth, except the two middle teeth, which are still the bunny sort of buck yes. teeth, just mm-hmm. for the, the fun. The, the middle incisors of, of the, the bunny. Yeah, because, uh, you know, the bunny girl's like, hey, you've misused magic, the penalty for which is death. Uh, here's you know, this full-page spread of this giant, like, bunny monster. Uh, th- th- this is just playful. This is, you know, the artist and the writer having fun yeah. with what they can do. The, I love the death metal font on the Destroyer of Souls. Yep. yep. Like so again, the letters, the letters having fun as well. Uh, and I like the color change here because it's not it. It's not exactly psychedelic, but like Zatanna's in different colors every time you see her. You know, so there's like a shifting that's going on that's that's telling you there's you know. Not that anything's wrong, but it's it's definitely a different I, realm. I think it adds to the idea that she feels disorientated. That every single yes. panel, she she looks different. That's disorienting is kind of a, yeah. a much better way of putting what I was trying to say. Yeah, and then eventually, after running from this bunny, and again, the, you know, it's almost like as well that there's less detail in each panel as it goes. Like yeah. the colors keep changing, but when you get to that second page where she's running away. It becomes just solid colors in the background, almost like as as it goes on, like reality slipping away more and more to just be these simplistic colors. Yeah. And then eventually, Zatanna finally says something backwards. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, she says, "Rabbit, uh, soul stop." Rabbit, stop soul crushing. Soul crushing. Sorry, yes. yes. I always see the thing with Zatanna, like speaking uh-huh. backwards, is I always sometimes question: Do the words also go backwards? And they don't. It's just the letters no. in the words that go backwards. Yes. Uh, but yeah, so that actually like snaps her out of this weird like you know dimensional rabbit hole she's in, and she's back in her bed, which is surrounded by bunnies at this point, and she's like, 
uh, what's that? And she's like, hey, you were special. Your dad was special. You always had magic in you. Uh, maybe, and basically implies that Zatanna, unbeknownst to her, has been speaking backwards in her sleep and making mm -hmm. her bunnies fly around. The, which I don't remember anything, but I, I would be mm. curious to go back to issue one now when she uh, like was leaving the house and she was speaking to yeah. her bunnies. I wonder if there was a hint there that something weird was happening during the night because I remember her like saying some stuff to the bunnies on the way out or like about yeah, and about the bunnies them. are kind of hiding from her. Yeah, right? yeah, like there was yeah, some hints. I do that, remember that. Yeah, something was going on. So I, I think that's fun uh, and sort of lines up with what what we were getting back in the first issue. Uh -huh. Um, but I so. Yeah, so Zatara basically like sneaks away by trying to do like a, a little smoke bomb trick, uh, which <laughs> leaves Bunny Girl to be like, "Damn it, we have to find her before they do." Talking to her bunnies, however, there's an eyeball spying on them at the window, yeah. which travels down the street on its own to the eye of a magician working, or I say, I say magician, a, for a conjurer, a conjurer working yeah. for the Council of Magic, and like, yeah, she's been using magic. I saw it with my own eye, so. <laughs> you know, it really presents that we've got these two forces. Bunny Girl's trying to help, seems to be on Zatanna's side. Council mm -hmm. of Magic seem to be, you know, I mean, it kind of gets into it because Zatanna goes to a diner and Bunny Girl comes in quite quickly and sits down with her and kind of explains some stuff. The, there never used to be all these rules for magic until uh, someone stole magic from someone else and then all these rules came mm -hmm. out of place and the council became a thing. And the reason why your father was seen as dangerous is because he was experimenting with forbidden spells and forbidden magic. Uh, and that, you know, we, we don't get like a clear answer, I think, by the end of this, but this idea, Zatanna theorizes, wait, did I steal my dad's magic when he died? Is that mm -hmm. what happened? And she's like, well, that's not quite right. But, you know, sometimes when these forbidden spells are used, it creates a demon. And that was the big demon that attacked her at her... her at her stage show. Her stage show, Yeah. Uh, in fact, we see someone working for the Magic Council, possibly a secret of that they're not supposed to, yeah. go to the old Zatara house and seemingly gets attacked by this big demon. Again, the color in here is so good. It's all these simplistic, yeah. like you know, uh, you know, two tone colors, like solid black backgrounds or solid like red back backgrounds with like a blue character. And it's, yeah, it's very flat. Yeah. Uh, which, which, you know, the, the rest of the art has a real good depth of feel. Like, them at the diner, there's this real fun page where the bunny girl starts explaining about the stealing magic, right? And and it's broken down uh, to, like, what she's showing her is, is popping up in the window of the diner, right? But people are just walking by. So there's a real fun depth effect there. So then when you get to those pages that are real flat down at the Z uh, Zatara house... It really creates a uh, like a separation. Uh, yeah, is, uh, it, it really here. feels that we're in a different like place mm -hmm. in the like a different type of world. Like it's some, yep. something where like other things are happening, like more supernatural things. Mm -hmm. uh, so after explaining all this, there's a tease of someone who's going to pop up at the end. Who I did notice, I did notice the trench coat at the yeah. diner. You know, he's from the back. It's clearly Constantine. Who you know, yep. the, the cliffhanger at the end's him kind of revealing himself, but. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, Stranger Girl shows up and is like, hey, Zatanna's coming with me. She's been uh, stealing magic from from things, or from people. And Bunny Girl's like, oh, you're so wrong. Do you ever tire from being wrong? So these two start arguing. It's like, yeah. okay, we've got these characters from the opposing forces. Zatanna's stuck in the middle and doesn't know what to do. And then the end of the issue, the waitress says, hey, here's the bill for the food. And Zatanna's like, I didn't order any food. It's like, no, yeah. but the guy at the counter said you had his uh, and sure enough, it's Constantine. And to be fair, she did phone someone earlier in the issue yeah. to ask for help before she went to the diner. And uh, here's Constantine, uh, who does know him, or you know, like, or sorry, she does know him. She knows. Yeah. Uh, this is not someone she doesn't know. So that's interesting that she's not been using magic, but still knows Constantine from her her youth. Uh, yeah. Curious to see how that's explored and, next issue. And the way that he calls her Z, there's clearly a familiarity there. Right? Yeah. Uh, he has a nickname for, um, yeah. Um, when when they're talking about Zatara and how he was kind of like this wonderkin magic user, right? It yeah. almost feels like it's a like I don't know. They're blaming him for something that had gone wrong, right? Uh, and I'm wondering if that is ultimately what he was trying to undo, 
and that what led to his death and Zatanna ending up with whatever. Because I'm feeling like Zatanna didn't steal the power. He found out how to bequeath power because it feels very much like this this Council of Conjurers are all about magic and maintaining their order, right? Because they have to have the rules and whatever, and they don't want people to be able to make, you know, they want to be able to bequeath the power, not for people to decide to hand it out. So I'm almost wondering if that's what Zatara had done and it kind of backfired uh, and it had created that demon and all this other stuff, you know, because Zatanna wanted to learn magic. She had that thing there. Um, and I'm wondering if that's why Constantine's there too, because that's the kind of stuff that he's really good at handling is the stuff that gets out of hand, you know, and maybe that's why he kind of maybe helped coach Zatanna along the way now that Zatara was gone. Uh, uh, because this feels almost like, you know, from, from your favorite show, Buffy, he almost feels like Giles here. I mean, I don't know if I got that. I mean, if, if anything, Constantine's similar to Spike, just in general. <laughs> no, I, what I mean is it almost seems like not just a mentorship, but almost like there's a, he's almost like he's looked out for her, you know, because of whatever had happened. I mean, right. maybe. I mean, I don't know. I, I like at this point, I have no speculation in their the nature yeah. of their relationship. They could be uh, someone who they could have dated when they were sort of, right. uh, you know, in college aged or whatever, high school aged. I have no idea where they're going with like what their history is here. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, you know, I I think there's definitely corruption in this magic council. I mm -hmm. think it's more about them maintaining their power. Whatever Zatara supposedly has had done. I suspect mm -hmm. that he was doing it for a good reason, perhaps. Obviously, yeah. we always like see him under this guise of Zatanna's memories, where he's kind of larger than life and he feels kind of yeah. shadowy, like he's like a, like he's a bit scary almost. But I suspect we're going to find out that he was actually doing something for a good reason, and mm -hmm. you know, I mean, the fact that this this character, this blue guy with a little tuft of hair, like sneaks off from the council to go to Zatara's place, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, that does feel like. Oh, is this someone who's doing something for a bad reason, like away from the council kind of thing? Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, he meets his demise in the flames when this big demon attacks him, but uh, it does feel like, oh, there's more going on here. Someone's at fault, and I suspect we're going to unearth like some bad stuff that the, this council's perhaps hiding. Yeah, and like their whole like quest for power and like covering things up is all about covering up something they've done to maintain their power, yeah. as opposed to. Oh, you know, people were actually doing something bad with magic. So yeah, uh, it feels very much like Naboo, right? That we've gotten in the past, and the Lords of Order, that kind of stuff. Aye, so, that Naboo, not not the stupid city in Star Wars. No, I'm not, I'm not talking about the prequels. Um, uh, but yes, uh, uh, but yeah, yeah. No, I mean, once again, uh, the art is is very good. It gets super creative, uh -huh. both in the the sequence where she's running from the imaginary big bunny monster. But mm -hmm. also when it's doing the stuff of that that sorcerer going into Zatara's place and like all the all the birds flying out going up the stairs, mm -hmm. it's sort of a really pulpy horror story that ends with this big ridiculous demon coming out and and killing him. Mm -hmm. uh, that stuff looks great, but it's also distinct from the regular stuff when it's just Zatanna in the real world talking to either Bunny Girl. I mean, there's obviously an element of quirkiness because Bunny Girl's got bunny ears and you know green hair green hair uh, yeah buck teeth like a rabbit so yeah um also there's just the coloring in this book you know i'm i'm assuming it's javier rodriguez the artist because i don't see a colorist mm. uh uh here listed but just just the amount of different colors that he's using right like there's a scene where zatanna's walking down the strip to go to the diner and just everything kind of has that pink hue that that we get out in the sunsets here you know uh, and, and just the, it makes the greens and the purples and everything else pop. Um, it's just there's some a lot of good work going on here with the art. Yeah, I think what sticks out about it is that it's not just that there's different colors. It's there's like different palettes depending on the type of yeah. scene that it is. You know, uh, between like looking into the 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 menu because you sort of magically makes the menu turn into like sort of like here's some story about your father uh, appearing. Yeah. And that's a very different palette from all the horror stuff with the demon, which is a very different yeah. palette from all the stuff with the bunny monster, which is a very different mm -hmm. palette from just what the regular everyday real world stuff looks like. So, yeah, all, all of it really creates the, the different vibes that it's going for, and it makes it very pleasant to read. This is a very easy to read book. Like, everything just flows yeah. so well. 
everything is, is entertaining. Zatanna's frustration. And, you know, I'm yeah. already, like, sensing this idea that, okay, Zatanna's repressed this idea that she can use magic her whole life. And this story is about her accepting that and realizing that she has this power. You know, like, I can already mm -hmm. see this being a stand-in for realizing your own self-worth or possibly even an allegory for realizing your own sexuality, maybe. You know, just things mm -hmm. like that that feel like they could be baked into the story here. So. As Matt's dogs get very loud because the doorbell rang. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, I mean, I think, I think we're about done. Uh, with this book is very good. Uh, I'm looking forward to yes. the next issue. So, more to Mackie at DC is always a good thing. Uh, what are you rating Zatanna Bring Down the House issue 3? I'm going to give this an 8.5. Yeah, I find it hard to to argue with that. I'm even tempted to even bump it to the 9, but I'll, I'll say 8.5. Yeah, I was thinking about that too, because it, it definitely feels like a middle chapter. I liked everything that I read. I just don't want to be over-exuberant on it. Right, so we'll see where this goes. All right, Power Girl issue twelve, Leah Williams writing with Travis Moore mm -hmm. on the art. Take it away, Matt. Yeah, so we're uh, we're getting um, uh, Power Girl and Valhalla. So uh, Paige Paige goes with Axel, right, and they're walking through the woods, and all I could think of was this feels very familiar, and they come across you know what looks like Asgard from from you know uh, mythology and. They come across this gigantic tree and there's this little squirrel with, with you know, like a horn on his head running around. And uh, it turns out it's, it's Ratatosk, the the keeper of Yggdrasil, which is a world tree, from uh, from that Wonder Woman run with uh, Conrad and I always forget the, the lady's name that wrote, right? Um, and yeah, so it turns out that Axel's kind of like this Indiana Jones for the Asgardians when there's something that the gods you know, thought was a good idea, but humanity can't handle, they send him to go bring it back. And so here, Kara meets uh, Ratatosk, uh, Ratatosk, who is obsessed with her golden hair. Um, and uh, there's this gigantic battle going outside the hall, and Siegfried's there, who was running around with Wonder Woman in those issues. Turns out he's Axel's cousin. Um, and uh, yeah, so so... Kara starts asking what, what's, what's with this battle. And this is the essentially what they do in, uh, in Valhalla. Uh, that every day they, they die. They, well, they fight, they die, they, they feast, and then they do it all again. Uh, and it definitely it's the afterlife for, for warriors. Um, Kara seems to be really good at this. She knocks down a whole bunch of Vikings, you know, with, with her, her superpowers, uh, which then, you know, gets Siegfried looking at her and, you know, kind of flirting, which Axel's like, hey, are you flirting with my date? Because you better, you know, not. Uh, and Zachary's like, hey, I'm just saying you, you have, you know, uh, you have good taste. So they end up in the hall, eating the dinner, feasting. And Kara notices, or Kara, Paige notices all of these, uh, like, different animals. And this is where it got a little bit, uh, like, heady. Uh, or not even heady. It gets a bit more more serious here is that all of these animals that you know that aren't exactly at the feast they're they're not eating but they're around the periphery they're all like these guardian animals that had given up their lives for what they had done right so uh there there was a, a rooster that a, a raccoon attacked the uh, the flock of chickens and, and he died saving them you know not a chicken was lost or there was this uh this dog that's sleeping on a bed named roxy who died protecting her owner from a black bear. Uh, and then there's cats, and there's there's a rat that they point out was a, a mine-sweeping rat that went across battlefields looking for, for mines that needed to be deactivated. Uh, and it makes Kara start crying because it's like this beauty of the afterlife uh, and kind of like, you know, this culture that takes care of those that have fallen. Um, and uh, Axel starts to, you know... He's like, yeah, you know, it can be beautiful if you know where to look. It's almost a bit sinister with the way that he's acting, but I think he's just being forward. Um, and so uh, they, she finds out that he was sent to get these, um, they're called Fade Bless Boots. And essentially they were boots that were meant for these Asgardian warriors that are meant to, uh, they're meant to withstand Ragnarok. 
but they give the wearer super speed. So uh, that's what he was down uh, when they first met at her. And the very first issue, she was having that, that uh, talk and that auction. They were in the auction. So he was there to, to get them. So they didn't end up in the wrong hands. They end up having a race. He puts on the, the super speed boots, um, him and Paige run across uh, Valhalla and Asgard uh, where they eventually fall into the snow and start making out. Um, and he ends up taking her to the kind of chamber where they keep everything. Um, it's called the charnel house of the God thought. And essentially it, everything that he finds uh, on these missions goes here for safekeeping. Uh, it's like a vault. And, and uh, the, the, so he can come and go, but the, the keepers of this vault are Odin's Ravens, Union and Union, which means, uh, you know, thought and memory. Um, he introduces them to, to uh, Kara, and they're done in this really fun way because of their names, thought and memory. Uh, they're the outline of Ravens, but uh, the outlines are filled with words. You know, uh, and those words change from page to page, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, so um, there's this there's this big uh, piece in this vault, and while they're in the vault, everything's kind of spacey. There, it looks kind of like like purple fog around, and uh, the items are just kind of floating there. And there's this there's this one piece in particular that is this mask. Um, that, that looks like a Greek sculpture, right? It's got the beard, it's got the haircut around this water and then this tree with uh, purple leaves. And uh, Paige asks, you know, what it is. And Axel explains it's called the Mirror of Mimir and it's uh, a scrying pool, but it's, you know, it only deals in secret knowledge. So Axel's like, yeah, you can ask it anything to show how it works. So Paige starts wondering what's Omen up to, right? Because in the last issue, they had to have this conversation that Omen's a little bit too involved in Paige's life. And so she kind of told her off. So there's there's a bit of a feeling of a guilt here with Paige. And so the the, the floating mask, eyes start glowing and um, all the water starts popping up around it. And Paige sees Omen in the middle of like this nightclub. Her eyes are crying, like her eyes are crying. She's crying, but there's like, dark smears coming down that's not just makeup and then uh the two ravens go start circling her and the words that pop up are like hurt selfish um blood on my hands killer and it ends with uh page saying that they have to go find omen um so a uh, a pretty nice little light issue uh, of of power girl with art by travis moore that looks fantastic um Especially the way that he draws Kara or Kara. I keep calling her Kara. I know it's Paige, but um, I'm missing a Supergirl book at this point, too. Um, with the way that he draws her with, with the hair, um, you know, that's down at shoulder length. She's starting to, you know, uh, really come into her own with the costume, the jacket and all that other stuff. Uh, and then just Asgard in and of itself looks beautiful. Um, just it's what you would think of Travis Moore, but with Vikings and set in that era. So, uh, real, real nice, uh, come down issue, uh, for the week. Uh, so I will give this a eight. Okay. Uh, Batman off world issue five, Jason Aaron writing with Doug Mankey on the R. So yeah, it'd been a little while since the last issue mm -hmm. of this, but uh, it, it kind of came back pretty quickly once yeah. I, I started reading it. Uh, and I enjoyed this quite a bit. Uh, art's obviously excellent throughout mm. i think the villains of the the black sun twins uh mm -hmm. wrath being the tall lady and then the little one uh well i can't remember the name of the little one but the little, mark. The little one yeah we'll just call him the little one the little one uh but yeah the first half of this is batman fighting that thanagarian assassin and struggling mm -hmm. dearly and r really you know it goes into a lot of detail and i was glad this was like a, a slightly oversized issue i mean i think they all have been but it's about 30 pages as opposed to the usual 20. Mm -hmm. And I like that because I was a little worried early on that too much of the issue was spent on this fight because it does last quite yeah. a while. Uh, but there's enough pages that you do actually get a decent bit of other stuff afterwards. Mm -hmm. In fact, it gets quite dark by the end. Um, I don't have much to yeah. say about the fight. It looks great. Uh, no no complaints. Yeah. 
But I like that it's it's Batman, right? Who's been supercharged by some of these the uh, alien technology, right? So he's still using gadgets and stuff. It's just alien yeah. gadgets. Um, and and it's typical. It's a typical Batman fight where he's fighting someone stronger than him, which I do like. Um, so Aaron understands what works in that. Like there's that, that sequence where he takes a punch right from the Thanagarian and then drifts off into space, and the Thanagarian looks down. And he's got a bomb placed on him i thought that was uh, oh that's not a bomb what was that <laughs> so uh batman's taken over uh his ship uh -huh. and it says on the computer of the ship that uh the the the, the auto tracking has been uh, affected by whatever's hacking it so it's batman's mm -hmm. thing that thing that he plants on his chest isn't a bomb it's like the the beacon for the ship so the ship then mm -hmm. flies into him oh okay well that's that's uh it, it, the effect's still the same, right? There's a, there's oh yeah, an there's explosion. an explosion. Yeah, yeah. Like I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. it's, it's, it's the, the the end result is pretty similar, but yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but that, that's what it is, though, because it sets it up on the previous page, gotcha. uh, and then that sort of lures it in. So he uses his own ship against him. So it's a fun little thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then by the end, he like charges up his suit with uh, the energy from the fake storm that the ship makes because it's you know it's yeah. the, the storm. Uh, what what do they call it? The storm uh -huh. something. It's uh, the great, uh, not the great storm. That's that's Thor. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll find it. You keep yeah, talking. Uh, whatever. Yeah. But yeah. he charges up his suit with it and starts punching the shit out of the Thanagarian, uh, mm -hmm. and then leaves the, the war storm. There you go. The war storm. Yes. And he leaves the Thanagarian basically on the ship with a bunch of punch robots <laughs> <laughs> as he leaves <laughs> with his bot. Punch, uh, punch back and fight back. Yeah, because the punch bot's basically saying, "Why are we leaving the war storm?" It's like the best asset we have is protecting us, and then Batman's like, "No, it's a target. It's this huge thing. Yeah. Like, no, we we can be much more effective if we're slying on the move." So he takes his alien dog, he takes Punchbot, and they go on their way uh, as Batman goes looking for you know locations and whatnot. Uh, but what's interesting about it though is the back half of the issue where the Black Sun twins come to a mining colony one of their mining colonies and mm -hmm. like they're like hey you've all been infected with something there's there's this bat character going around infecting you with a disease that disease is hope and we're here to like rid that from you anyone who wants to like you know form an uprising now is your chance we're standing right here come for it and you know she smiles like really creepily because uh, the design yeah. of these characters is really good. This red sort of like, but only like under their like their jaw is red. Yeah, like the top it's half from is... the jaw up to the ear and then yeah. down. That's like uh, a really creepy visual. It's a really good design. Yes. Uh, so that's a tease for what's happened. But we find out afterwards that Batman like comes to this moon, and all of these aliens are dead. Like they are all dead. This has been complete mm -hmm. genocide, and it turns out that. Yeah, the big one, Wrath, like, killed a bunch of them herself for fun, but most of it was actually the little one's power of, like, persuading people by just whispering in their mm -hmm. ear what to do. He made them kill each other, and Batman, like, asked the robot how many people have died on this moon. Turns out it was multiple moons as well, and mm -hmm. the robot's like, oh, like, 12 billion? <laughs> Something yeah. like that. It's like some obscene number. Yes. And Batman just breaks down. He's like, 12 billion people are dead because of me, what mm -hmm. the hell? Maybe I should give up this Batman shit. Maybe I should just go home. Maybe I'm over my head. I don't belong here. Uh, and he even thinks about Ione at one point here, and that oh yeah. maybe maybe she's his way out of here. And he even thinks about kissing her and like has a little mm -hmm. uh, like romantic moment in his head. Uh, but the reveal here is that she's actually here to take him in for the bounty. And she had a scene earlier, just before this with uh, the Thanagarian, where she seemingly killed the Thanagarian. Uh huh. To stop him from getting after Batman, which maybe in that moment you might think, oh, she's doing that to protect Batman. Uh, but then she shows up, she lifts up her gun and says, you're coming with me. And yeah, the end of the issue is her dropping Batman off with the Black Sun twins. And she's like, oh, he means nothing to me. I don't even want to watch you torture him. And she walks off and the final full page spread is the tall one saying, oh, my uh, little brother here has been waiting to have a word with you, Batman. So he's he's creepily just kind of like sort of hovering over Batman's like bad, yeah. badly beaten up and bloody body. Just like, oh, I'm going to whisper in your ear and tell you to do all sorts of things. 
Uh, which, you know, Batman having his control taken away is probably like the most torturous thing you could probably do yeah. to him. So I, I see big, big outcomes from this. Uh, I guess the question I have for you, Matt, is like, does Ioni have some kind of other plan or motive here? Mm-hmm. Or is she just turned heel? Is she just doing this no. because she wants to get the bounty? No, I think she's doing both. She's doing that thing where she's going to get the bounty and then she's going to turn around and turn on the black sun. So I feel like this is part of a plan. Um, that she's having, because remember, she was a storm chaser, right? She was employed by them in the war storm. So we don't... I can't remember if we got her full origin, right? Um, but I, I'm assuming they've done bad things, and now, you know, uh, she's holding that. So I, I definitely think this is... I don't think she's turned full heel. Um, I think no, she'll, I mean, she'll be back around. I think it's entirely possible that we'll cut back to that scene where she lifted up her gun and we'll get mm-hmm. like a whole conversation they had and that yeah. Batman's even like agreed to this because it's a plan or something. Uh, maybe she gave him a pep talk and convinced him that he can change stuff by actually taking mm-hmm. out the twins somehow. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I did like how dark this got. I like that, that these villains just mm-hmm. like killed an entire, you know, colonies worth of people several colonies worth of people yeah. and i mean the, it's two earths worth of people right we have about seven billion yeah, yeah. on earth right but now but the idea that batman yeah. has to feel the weight of like wait uh-huh. my having like any kind of influence here caused this they did mm-hmm. this to stamp out the idea that these people were starting to believe that they could rise up and maybe deserve better and i am in some way responsible for that and like seeing Batman struggle with that is actually kind of interesting and wild. Mm-hmm. Um, it's almost like if in Superman War World saga, like if after Superman tried to convince everyone to like rise up from slavery, if Mongol just killed them all outright and said, yeah. "No, they're all dead now. What are you going to do now, Superman?" <laughs> yeah, what, what are you going to do? Uh, so this is what this is the price of hope. You yeah. Know? So. Yeah. Uh, very curious to see. I, I mean, I'm impressed that despite how outrageous this story is from like, a, oh, Batman's in space and it's all these mm-hmm. aliens and stuff, how compelling that I've found most of it and how yeah. much I like Ione, uh, how much I like the fact that the assassin was a Thanagarian. And mm-hmm. these villains, the Black Sun twins, are legitimately creepy and have a good bit of character to them. So, uh, yeah. yeah, despite the long delay between this and the last issue, I found myself quickly into this and really enjoying it by the end. Yeah, well, that's kind of on par for most of the good Aaron work that I've read. He does this kind of stuff where he's able to come around and he can balance the darkness with the the more heroic aspects of the character. Because um, I don't know if you ever read Southern Bastards, uh, which was his creator owned. It, it got pretty dark at points, but he was always able to to dig out and remind us of why these characters are doing why you know, why they're doing what they're doing, and there's a more noble cause. Uh, and I feel like that's perfectly on display here right is like yeah batman feels the full weight of 12 billion lives but batman's gonna do what's right you know so there's not more that end up like that uh because there's two kinds of evil right the people that do it and the people that allow it uh so so yeah and i I feel like he's he's built this uh you know a, a little bat family in space right if we if what we're if what we think about ioni is true right is just part of a plan He's got that big wolf. He's got punch bot. He's got her. So I, I'm I'm assuming that she's also maybe rallying up the you know I mean other that, people that are tired of the black sun. That's the hope. But like yeah. you know, you can also read her. I you know he means nothing to me. Is her being pissed that he rejected her before? That could be you know? true because you know that's always yeah. a possibility. But you know even without her, even just the the robot and the. The, yeah. the space dog <laughs> like yeah. it already feels like he's built a little team that said though yeah. i do suspect the reason why she doesn't want to stay around and watch mm-hmm. is not because she either like will feel hurt by watching it or because yeah. she doesn't genuinely care it's probably more that the part of the plan is her to go and do something else while they're distracted mm-hmm. with batman right this idea yes. that they're, yeah. they're going to be focused on batman so she can go and mm-hmm. mess with their systems release someone else from yeah. a cell or something whatever it may mm-hmm. be but I suspect there's a plan brewing here and that's what's going on. So Yeah. And well we do know that Tamaranians do have a temper too. So sure. you know may- maybe it starts as that like oh, I don't care and it's just, oh, I can't leave him. That type of stuff too. But yeah, either way, uh I was worried that I was gonna have a hard time remembering a lot of that stuff, but it came right back. So that that's some good storytelling. Yeah, no. 
Uh, I think it was maybe smart as well. Maybe Aaron knew there was going to be a gap because the yeah. first couple of pages is Batman being confused about where he is. And he kind yeah. of reiterates the premise of the book as he's realizing that he's in the middle of a fight. <laughs> and he's like, yeah. oh, I've been not kind of, you know, wacky here. And like, oh, I'm in space. That's right. Like he kind of like just gives some bullet points to get you back into the swing of it. And mm-hmm. maybe that was a genuine like choice on on Aaron's part because he knew that yeah. people might struggle with a bit of a gap. So mm-hmm. uh, no, very good. And the art is is pretty gorgeous. Like Mankey's like use of like heavy lines and and shadows mm-hmm. is 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 very good. And uh, you know it's very vibrant. You know the red on the villains really stands uh-huh. out. It's part of what makes them so creepy. It's very Hellraiser because they're kind of like yeah. You know the red's not actually this, but it does kind of evoke the idea of like if someone's like not wearing skin and you can see the muscles. That's what yeah. the red makes me think of, is that kind of visual, which makes me like think they very... Have their skin peeled away? Yeah, it's very hellraiser yeah. because of that. Yeah? So, yeah. Um, there's there's that panel of uh, where well, they're on that, that moon, and, you know, basically they say, have at the... And the people swarm, and they're just, they're alone in this big black, like, void. I think that that's another, that's a very, I don't want to say iconic, but... That, that that has stuck out since I read this earlier the, yeah. this week. And that smile on her face as she says mm-hmm. that come at us uh, yeah. is very telling. And you're like, oh, these yeah. people are doomed. Like they they, yep. they might think, oh, we 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 outnumber them by so many, but they are just yeah. doomed. And you know it from that smirk. Yes. So it's uh, very good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, no. Uh, we we rating Batman off world. Uh, I'm gonna as an eight point five. Uh. Yeah, hard to argue. I, I think it, yeah, like the art just nudges it up a little bit into that 8.5 mm-hmm. range, so I, I agree with that. All right. Nice House by the Sea, issue two, James Tyne in the fourth with Alvaro Martinez Bueno on the R. So let's try and piece together this puzzle of a <laughs> of a comic. And I no always, kidding. And I only say that because there's so many characters. Now, this issue is all set around the characters from the original house that are now in, you know, day 700 something. Yep. and how things have changed and i was a little bit iffy in the middle because i was like wait we had that big cliffhanger last time of like some of these characters <sighs> arriving on the new house well it's not new obviously they started at the same time but new to us yeah right yeah and i was like oh are we really not going to address that obviously this issue is all about building up to like how they got there like you know basically we get mm-hmm. the point at the end here where they walk through a portal and it's like okay that's that moment syncing up this is us getting to grips again with these characters. And it does do some really smart things. I love how it starts with uh, that stuff in the future again. And it's uh, the, mm-hmm. the artist, Ryan, yep. who is in like her post-apocalyptic kind of get up. And she's talking to the audience just like, you know, in the first, you know, in the first series did. And mm-hmm. she basically talks about how, oh, Walter had feelings for me. but I, And I, I cared about Walter, but I was never, I was never, I never felt for him the way he wanted me to. And it does this little flashback story where she overhears Walter talking to another friend and this idea that you have to like stop beating yourself up. She's kind of a dick for going home with someone. Uh, but, you know, like she can't replace Oliver, right? And they bring up this name Oliver. And mm-hmm. Ryan says like in her present day like storytelling narration, that's the first time I ever heard the name Oliver. I never knew there was an Oliver or that I was kind of replacing that person in Walter's life or whatever that may be. So from here, it's like, okay, this this idea of Oliver comes up. And what's really interesting is at the end of the book, when they go through the portal, one of the last lines we hear before we get to see anything and it goes to the cliffhanger is, Oliver, you're alive. Someone recognizes this Oliver from the other house. So it's very interesting that someone else put together this second house, but there's a character there that Walter knew and cared about and was seemingly hung up on but then that person was in this other alien's life that put together a mm-hmm. house and is now at the second house. So that 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 paid off really well. When I got to the end and someone said, Oliver, because it's not like I remembered from the first issue that no. there's a character named Oliver, because like, yeah, come me on. Neither. <laughs> yeah. Like, there's yeah. so many characters. We've got like 24 characters now to deal with between the two well, houses. It helped, it, I, it helped by what we're, they're described as like the pianist, yes. the acupuncturist, the reporter. I can't remember the their actual names. I just Not remember at their all. designation. Not at know? all. And when it gets to like going through these characters, like I didn't even realize it was all characters from the first house uh, immediately. It wasn't until it got to uh, Nora and stuff. I was like, oh, okay, this is like, the first house. This is like them. This is them after the death of that one guy who, you know, or that one woman who was shot. The doctor. Uh, yeah. 
and like you know them talking about that visiting her grave it's been some time since then and i'm mm-hmm. like oh, okay and a big part of the plot of this issue is that is that a dog shows up in a crate and no one takes credit for asking for a dog but yeah. they're all debating about what they should do about the dog is the dog safe is it just an alien um and then it all but bubbles up to this moment towards the end where the one of the characters is controlling the place just like someone at the other house where they're picking the weather <laughs> they're doing the radio dj stuff in the morning and he's like hey i'm not controlling this storm it's not doing stuff that i'm telling it to and then it's lightning striking that weird symbol that when they touch that symbol they see the real world for a split second uh-huh. uh, that creates the portal and a few of them are like hey we're going in like we want to see what this is this this reminds me of like the back channels when walter showed me it and they all yeah. think walter's dead or they at least, I mean, they're suspecting that it may not really be dead, but it may all right. just be part of the, the, the game. But, mm-hmm. you know, so they've not seen Walter in hundreds of days at this point. So, so it's very interesting, because, you know, 700 something days, that's about two years, right? They're about two yeah. years out from coming in here. So, very interesting. Uh, like, s- seeing all this play out. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and the the dynamics are still there, right? With the because the guy that's doing the um because he's in the control house, it's the yeah. comedian. So it seems like they're taking turns, right? So he's playing Weird Al. It's his turn to be in control of stuff. But um, when the dog shows up, it goes to you know Tynan likes to put in these prose pages almost, right? And if you read through there, it seems like someone's like, yeah, well we try to get people here and that never worked. So how oh, like where did this dog come from? This doesn't. Isn't anything by the rules? Yeah, it, it just so, it, just by what you mean there. When you say we tried to get people here to just yeah. explain that because it's a weird sentence. They've gotcha. asked for people in their deliveries. Like, can we ask for right. someone to show up in the same way that we can ask for food supplies to show right. up? And one of them says, "No, I tried that early on. It didn't work." Yeah. But someone's asked for a dog, possibly. Right. Uh, although, the, honestly, it kind of feels like maybe no one asked for the dog, and that's yep. maybe what's going on. But mm-hmm. it seems like someone's asked for a dog and a dog show up, so we can ask for animals. That's kind of yeah. interesting. You know, that's a new thing. Yeah. So and and the house is divided on how to deal with the dog and you know all this other. So again, but after you get the, just the vibe from after seven hundred days, they they've you know they've almost they've developed a society in within the house. Yeah, just kind of like we've seen at the other. Like the only thing that ties the two issues together is that sense of of that they've lived there for a while, and this is what the interpersonal you know, kind of politics are. Yeah, no, it's interesting, uh, and it's funny because this house does feel a lot like the other house at this point after mm-hmm. this time, and it makes me wonder: was I wrong to assume that this other house had more knowledge to start with, or yeah. was that just because oh, it's been two years, so they've had more time to kind of adapt and find to, out to about develop. things? Yeah. So yeah, uh, um, that said I also, though, there you go. I was gonna say I also like too that it tells us in the blurbs on who the people are when they were chosen by Walter, right? Yeah, and so it's, it's, you it's, can kind of get the it's, friend groups from there. Well, you know? it's, it's interesting though because obviously, yeah, there's the college cluster and the high school uh-huh. cluster, and most of them were picked, you know, twenty years ago, fifteen years right. ago. But there's one or two that are notably much more recent. Like you know, this yes. person was only picked two years ago. And it's like, mm-hmm. okay, this is where the changes were made, where he was swapping people in or out for, uh-huh. for various reasons. Like, yeah, it's, it's there throughout. Yeah. Um, and they even put a character guide at the back of the issue, because they, they, they must know, yeah, yeah it's, it's difficult to keep up with all of these characters. Mm-hmm. I, I almost wish I just had that up at the side on my second monitor when I'm reading yeah. the book, just so that I, I can like refer back to it at any point. Uh, but yeah. No, it's it's all good, and it's this them kind of like accepting this dog, and some of them become kind of attached to the dog, and it's the dog that leads them out to the 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 monolith because the dog is yes. out during the storm. So again, there's a nice bit of atmosphere and all that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as this is happening, there's like a really kind of more intense conversation between Reggie and and Nora. I think the characters' names are, uh, yeah. but you know, Nora's the really sort of moody one and. It's basically, yeah, like, why why haven't we compared notes and talked about how Walter kind of made his help design this place? Obviously, mm-hmm. we forgot a lot of it, but now we're remembering it. Why haven't we, like, talked about that more? And yeah. they're just kind of, they, they're at this kind of stalemate and they're, like, not wanting to, like, deal with the fact that someone was shot here and, like, you know, we're not actually that close. We're not friends, not having been in a long time. Uh, so, you know, things are really kind of ramping up in an emotional perspective and then as soon as this lightning strike happens, 
this is these are the characters that are kind of there to to go through yeah uh, well it's ryan reggie and nora who they're kind of those were the the three kind of key characters in the first uh yeah so ryan's the, the art. series ryan's the artist ryan's this the... issue's been focused on this, yep. this is the one who didn't know who oliver was because she came after right. oliver so presumably mm-hmm. it's one of the other two who says yep. wait oliver you're alive so it'll be one of the other two that knows you know yeah. Walter from before Ryan that will be recognizing that character. So uh you know and obviously the art gets really fun here because it starts doing all these sort of weird like light swirls and stuff. And of course at the end it reveals uh that yeah th- like no one asked for this dog. In fact it seems like this dog is just Walter himself. Uh yep. the dog mutates and we see those like sort of the the, the glasses, the white solid white yep. glasses that we we see with him. Uh you know, he led them there, which is interesting. That that's actually I mean, that's maybe the biggest revelation I wasn't even thinking about mm-hmm. is the idea that Walter wanted some of his people to go through here and see the other yes. house. This isn't something they did by accident or did mm-hmm. on their own, like some of the stuff they did in the first series. It, this is Walter driving them to go and seek out this second house and have that interaction. For what purpose? We'll find out, I guess. Who knows? Yeah, so the the way that Reggie and then and Nora were arguing. Reggie tells Nora that Walter always thought he was in control, but we know that wasn't always true, right? Mm. And then the lightning strike happens, and then Walter's revealed the dogs revealed to be Walter, right? So it's like, okay, well, who's pulling Walter's strings now, right? Or is Walter actually, you know, well, uh, finally in control of this, you know? Well, well, think of it less of as he in control, but I think the more important question there is. Is this someone pulling Walter's strings, or is this Walter going off book and disobeying the rules of whatever right. society he's in, whatever his right. boss is, whoever his boss mm-hmm. is, like the rules of this experiment with all the different houses? This seems like he's breaking the rules. Now, I could be wrong, but this right. feels like Walter going outside of what he's supposed to be doing uh-huh. because he wants to, I don't know, break the entire system down by having like different houses collude and like find yeah. out about each other and maybe understand or learn some things. Kind of, yeah, it kind of ruins the experiment if, you know, right? So does that mean they have to restart? And, or what does it mean? And keep in mind, one of these people at the other house, this Oliver character, is someone that uh-huh. Walter knew. So presumably that's right. why Walter picked this specific house for his house yes. to intermingle with. Now, is right. it because he specifically cares about Oliver? Or is that just the, the, the right choice because of whatever else he wants to do? Like, if yeah. his goal is to break things down, does he just think it'll work better because he knows someone at that house to... To mess with things I, I mean i don't know I, i'm just like spitballing through the, the various possibilities yeah uh so was, oliver yeah. was the actor from the first issue that was the actor that was the that, that was, was the, the actor that, that was the main one we were following in the first issue yes okay yep good to know so, good to know yeah uh yeah the art here's gorgeous all that stuff at the mm-hmm. end like, even just before it turns into walter the dog in the rain is so atmospheric they were the, yep. the sort of the glow of the moonlight off the the white fur uh the rain around it just just really good stuff all the lightning looks great um you know i i almost didn't recognize it was ryan getting out of the portal at the end because the the bright white light sort of mm-hmm. like hides the blue hair because they because the yeah. hair, hair is blue but it almost mm-hmm. just looks like it's blonde or gray in this final couple of panels because the yeah. the lighting of the of this flash of light of the storm yeah and uh, uh, yeah but no, really, really effective. I do appreciate though that we're only going to maybe have three characters from their initial house yeah. because having all twenty four of them at the same time, Oof. well, twenty three because one died. But you know, like having right. all of them together at the same time would be a nightmare. So having these three key act- characters from the first story to like focus mm-hmm. on interjecting into the other house, I think because I, I mean, I, we'll probably see it again at some point. But I don't think we're going to be bouncing back to this first house constantly. I feel like now mm-hmm. that these three characters are on the new house. I think mm-hmm. we're going to be staying in the new house for most of this yeah. series. It felt like a this is what this house is going on, but now the status quo is these three through that portal, yeah. and now whatever happens for the rest of the series. So very very curious. So I, I like this show yeah. a lot. You know, my only my only mm-hmm. negative was maybe as I was reading that I was like, wait, are we really not going back to that cliffhanger? But then by the end, it's like, oh no, yeah. this is how they get there. This is just sort of setting the scene for where these characters all are at this point in the house's life and. Now they're here. So I'm very excited for, for next issue. It kind of feels that like issue one and two were very much setting up what this story is going to be. Mm-hmm. And now issue three is where it's really going to start to properly yeah. get into the, the meat of it, which is cool. Mm-hmm. So, uh, what are you rating, Matt? Uh, I'm going to give this a solid eight. 
I mean, I'm still happy to go up to what eight point five. I've given like three things eight point five, but eight point yeah. five. Uh, yeah. I, I think it's just touching on that. Like, it's it's great. It's very great. It's just touching on excellent, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, it's really excited to have this book back. So, yeah, that'll take us on to the part of the show where we pick our favorite stuff of the week, favorite panel slash moment, favorite cover, favorite art, and of course, top five books. So Matt, what is your panel mm -hmm. slash moment of the week? Oh man, there's there's some really good ones. Um, Tech had had that opening page by March. I thought was really good. Um, probably the the high point uh, of the art in in that issue. Um, nice nice house. The the dog transforming to Walter was pretty good. Um, my but mine's gonna be from Zatanna, and it's gonna be that page where she goes down the bunny well. So mm -hmm. I just think there's so much going on there. All the colors are popping. It looks like chaos, but it's it's fully in order. Uh, and yeah, so that one's mine. Yeah, I think if I was going for like an art moment, I'd probably pick the monster bunny from Zatanna. Mm -hmm. If I was going, you know, I I could maybe pick some of the stuff from Tech where like the the frustration. Uh, of of mummy mummy argum <laughs> his mm -hmm. name I've forgotten already again. Uh, Daria. Daria, yeah, not going to remember that. But uh, like her being frustrated was a really good like story point for me there. I, I think what I'm going to actually go with though is the moment in Batman Off World where Batman sees all the dead bodies. Like there's just there's so much weight behind it. It's surprisingly effective that uh, mm -hmm. I got to go with that. But yeah, that's my pick. Uh, cover of the week for me. Uh, really like the main cover for. A nice House by the Sea. Um, I'm not one who usually gravitates towards the Tula Lote covers as much as you and Connor do, but that Zatanna mm -hmm. one is pretty nice, I have to admit. Uh, I have to say, though, Detective's got a couple of absolute bangers. Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, Mike Perkins cover, which is like just Batman going through like the rainy Gotham City with the yellow sort of lighting, is yeah. just really simple but really effective. I love how... Just like it feels like a sea of buildings because they just go out of frame like above Batman, yeah. so it just feels. And like then the endless. way that the cape is flowing with the rain lines, right? Yeah. Like yeah, so it looks real cool. That's awesome. As is the main cover with Mister Freeze with a snow globe. Uh -huh. If I'm picking one though, I'm going to go with the Perkins cover for Detective. Okay. Uh, I think that's my that's my cover of the week. What you what you yeah. got? Um. So I also want to bring up that uh, there is a Dan Mora off world cover. That's oh, sure. got. Batman, but it's not done with the traditional uh, Mora inks and colors, so it it almost looks like a like like the cover of a fantasy book, which I think works out really well for for that. So I wanted to mention that one. Um, you mentioned the the Zatanna one. I mean, all the Zatanna covers. The main cover there's a Dotson uh, variant that looks like a poster for a magic show uh, that looks real good. But yeah, no, that Tula Lote Zatanna cover just perfect. The, the yep. way that the blue and the, the orange in the background go together, the way she's standing there, the composition, everything is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, all right. Art of the week. Okay. So for me, this comes down to, to Offworld, Zatanna, and Nice House. Uh, and I think I would agree uh, with that being the, the, the contenders. Yeah. Yeah. So it just kind of where I feel... I, th I think, though, for as good as Nice House was, um, I think I'm going to give it to Zatanna just because of the... We talked about the color work throughout mm. and and how how they, you know, are, are change the way they're telling the story as the story is being told, right? With the flats and, and yeah. all that other stuff. So there's a lot of good stuff in there. So yeah, it's tough because they're very different styles and they're both very effective in what they're doing. I think I'm just going to edge okay. out to Nice House by the Sea, though, just because I sure. think there's so much atmosphere in the style that... that uh, mm -hmm uh alvaro martinez bueno is doing that i just I, I think i have to edge out to that but it's very close uh between that off world and zatanna mm -hmm. uh this week but yeah all right top five books matt all right so one is going to be zatanna uh two is going to be tech three is going to be off world four is nice house and five is power girl all right uh one for me I think is Nice House by the Sea. Two. Mm -hmm. Batman Offworld. Three Zatanna. 
four detective. March is kind of the one pulling that down a little bit. It would be more of a fight if it wasn't. And then yeah. five is just by default absolute power origins, which I did like though quite a bit still. So yeah. uh, good week, uh, despite it was a weird week of books in terms of what books we had because it's mostly side stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. Really good week uh, for quality though. So very consistent. So happy, happy all the same. Uh, all right, I'll tell you what's coming next week from DC Comics. We have Batman One Five Two. We got Absolute Power Issue Three. We got Poison Ivy Twenty Five. Birds of Prey Thirteen. Justice Society of America Eleven. Whoa. So yeah, we're almost done with that. Uh, the Boy Wonder Issue Five, which I think is the final issue of that too. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got the Penguin Issue Twelve. Plastic Man No More Issue One. So we got a new number one to try. Uh, My Adventures with Superman 4, Batman Scooby-Doo Mysteries, uh, The Trinity Special World's Finest 1, which, is that just a reprint of Backups again? Because they did that yes. before, yeah. Yep, it's the next Fair It's enough. the next chunk of them. Fair enough. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah, uh, some interesting yeah. stuff next week. Uh, the event issue should be fun. Birds of Praise mm-hmm. and Penguin have been excellent, and we'll see what that new Plastic Man mini's like. So, yeah. yeah, so the Plastic Man one, that's that Christopher Cantwell book that got... Uh, I remember talking about it in solicits, so it's a black label. That should be fun. Yeah, yeah, we'll check that out. See, see how it is. Uh, but yeah, that is that is, that is the show. Uh, also, I'll have some Patreon books next week as well. At least one. I may spread them out. But uh, yeah, I would have done one this week. But as I said, we started an hour late, and uh, I am starving. Mm-hmm. So thank you for joining us, everyone. You can of course support the show over at Patreon.com/slash/MailFuzzTV. Helps out to keep the podcast coming, as well as all the other content that I do at MailFuzz Movies and MailFuzz TV. But uh, check out that, and uh, of course you can like, subscribe on YouTube, share the podcast out, any of these things is a big help and Mm -hmm. uh, keeps the show alive and going. But uh, that is it, so thank you very much for joining us, we do appreciate it, keep reading DC Comics, and remember to never get lost in the Speed Force.